And we are now going to hear from one of our regional experts who will speak to the issue of climate change in the Caribbean. And so our next presenter is Dr. James Jimmy Fletcher, a consultant and a former Minister of Government in the Ministry of Public Service, Sustainable Development, Energy, Science and Technology in St. Lucia. Jimmy, if I may be permitted to refer to him as such, I've known him for quite a while, is perhaps best known for his work in international climate change negotiations, where he led the Caribbean's delegation to the negotiations on the Paris Agreement in 2015 and was an integral part of the region's 1.5 to stay alive climate change civil society advocacy campaign. He was a member of a small select group of ministers who were charged with the responsibility for achieving consensus among the parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change on the elements of the Paris Agreement. Currently, Dr. Fletcher manages his own consulting company, Soloricon. And if with those brief introductory remarks, I invite Dr. Fletcher to address us. Thank you very much, Sir Trevor. Um, my association with Sir Trevor actually goes back to, I think, the formation of the HCC at a time when, quite coincidentally, I was the Director of Social and Sustainable Development at the OECS, what at the time was the OECS Secretariat, and had responsibility for climate change and health. Um, so it's quite coincidental and quite interesting that these two are coming together and what have brought me here to talk to you today about climate change in the Caribbean. Minister, good morning. Professor Hassel, other distinguished invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Really, I've titled this presentation Business Unusual because our response to climate change in the Caribbean has to be a business unusual one. And the Minister of Health and Wellness in his presentation, I think, articulated very clearly the challenges that confront us. And really, the question we have to ask ourselves is, Ray, how serious is the problem? We've heard that, yes, it might be fake news, that it's overblown, and the scientists are making a big deal or bigger deal of this than it really is. But the evidence is overwhelming. It's not, it's not easy to get hundreds of scientists to come together to agree on any one thing. And they've done that where climate change is concerned. In fact, recently, um, quite a few of them penned uh, a letter stating that climate change is the biggest threat facing the world right now. And that's, that's for those of you who know scientists, and I happen to be one of them, my roots are in science, um, it's difficult to get us to agree on one thing, and we've all agreed on this. Greenhouse gas emissions are increasing, and this is what has been happening with global greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see with this curve, with the onset of, of heavy industrialization, and when this, this appetite, this almost insatiable appetite that, that we've developed for more and bigger and better started kicking in in the 1950s, then with it had to come a lot of manufacturing to be able to produce the items that we so covet. And now even more so with the iPhones and the Samsung Galaxies and everything else that we must have every year, there's a price that we pay for it. And that, that price of unbridled consumption and production is um, an increase in greenhouse gases. And we can see what has been happening to our temperature curve. When we started measuring temperatures in the 1880s, you don't have to be a mathematics major. You don't have to understand graphs to see what is happening with that curve and to see how sharply that temperature curve has been increasing. And really the last, the hottest years in the history of our planet, in the recent history of our planet, have been the last five years. 2016 was the hottest year ever recorded. And that's, that's important because 2016 was also an El Nino year. And El Nino has a, an impact of increasing the temperature. But even some of the other years that were not El Nino years, 2017, 2015, 2018, 2014, these have been the hottest years in the history of our planet. And wait not for 2010 sneaking its head in there, we would actually say that the last six years have been the last have been the hottest years in the history of our planet. Well, 2019 didn't want to be left behind. So June 2019 was actually the hottest June on record for our planet. And then July came around. And then July was not just the hottest July on record, but July was the hottest month ever in the history of our planet. We saw temperatures being broken in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Spain, in Paris, in the UK temperatures, record temperatures shattered. Then August came around and same thing, 
hottest on record for the Northern Hemisphere, and the period of July, June to, sorry, June to um, August was the hottest summer ever recorded. September didn't want to be left behind, so September is the hottest September ever on record, tying 2016. October, you think that as we get past the summer, the temperatures will start cooling. October was recorded as the hottest in Earth's history, and November, the last month, was Earth's second warmest November on record. Two days ago, Australia recorded its hottest day ever. Um, so really, it shows us that the warming trend is relentless, and 2019 is now on track to be the second hottest year in the history of our planet. So go back to what I said earlier, that had it not been for 2010 sneaking its head in, the last six years would have been the six hottest years. By the time this year is through, the last six years would have been the six hottest years in the history of our planet. So what does this mean? Well, Arctic temperatures are actually rising faster than temperatures around the world. So the global average, while we talk about two degrees Celsius, and we see that right now we've, we're actually at a one degree Celsius warming, in the Arctic, the temperature is rising faster than it's rising for the global average. So what that means is our polar ice caps are melting, and they're melting at a much faster rate. Greenland, we experience an ice melt in Greenland this year. That was what scientists had predicted would be the worst case scenario for 2070. Just let that sink in. 2070 is 51 years away. And we experienced an ice melt in Greenland that was predicted to be the worst case scenario for 2070. So if that doesn't tell you that the situation is very serious, that it's very desperate, and I don't know what will. Um, sea levels are rising faster than anticipated. By the end of the 21st century, it has been predicted that sea levels will rise between one and two meters above current levels. Well, what does that mean to the Caribbean? We have one or two meter sea level rise. As the minister pointed out, the economic and social juggler for all of our countries is along our coast. All of our economic infrastructure, all of our social infrastructure is along our coast. Most of our populations reside along our coast. So you do not need to extrapolate too far to figure out what a one meter or two meter sea level rise will mean for the Caribbean. But let's look at some of the data that, that the UNDP and Carib Save and the five seas have, have come up with. They've predicted that for a one meter sea level rise in CARICOM, approximately 1300 square kilometers of land mass will be lost. So that's actually equivalent to the land mass of Barbados plus Antigua and Barbuda plus St. Vincent the Grenadines plus Anguilla disappearing. Now I'm not suggesting that these countries will disappear. <laughs> I'm saying that a landmass around the Caribbean equivalent to the landmass occupied by these countries will disappear. Over 110,000 people will be displaced. So that's the equivalent of the population of Grenada having to find a new place to live, having to move inland. 149 tourism resorts damage. Why? Because we believe that part of the Caribbean tourist experience is for the tourists to walk out of their room, curl their toes in the sand, and walk straight into the ocean. Well, there's a price we'll pay for that. And that is that at the front line of the battle against climate change will be our high-density, high-value tourism infrastructure. Loss or damage of five power plants, loss or damage of 21 CARICOM airports. Many of our airports are actually located pretty close to the, to the coastline, and 567 kilometers of roads being lost. That's at the lower estimate. At a two meter sea level rise, it gets, of course, predictably more serious. Over 3,000 square kilometers of land being lost, so that's equivalent to Martinique, Guadeloupe, and Grenada disappearing. That's over 260,000 people displaced. If I'm not mistaken, Minister, that's the population of Barbados. Um, over 233 tourism resorts damage, loss or damage of nine power plants, loss or damage of 31 CARICOM airports, loss of 710 kilometers of roads. There are actually some simulations you could do, and this, this website, um, choices.climatecentral.org, shows you what a two meter, uh, one meter sea level rise, sorry, a two degree Celsius warming and a four degree Celsius warming would mean for, for Barbados. So on the left side is a two degree Celsius warming, which is where we've said that we need to keep the temperature below two degrees Celsius and for small island developing states, preferably, at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And it shows you that for two degrees Celsius warming, there will be serious inundation in Bridgetown, in Whole Town, in Spitestown. In fact, if you look at the inundation in Bridgetown, it's quite serious. Um, at a four degree Celsius warming, it's again, even more profound. For my country, St. Lucia, um, the international airport in Viewfort, Yonora International Airport, will be completely inundated. So it means that the peninsula of Viewfort will now be cut off from the rest of the country at a two degree Celsius warming. At a four degree Celsius warming, again, even more. 
unless you think that we talk about by the year 2100, if Barbados and the rest of the Caribbean is anything like my country, St. Lucia, and you believe you're taking some comfort in the fact that you will be dead by the time 2100 comes around and you won't have to worry about it. Well, in my country, St. Lucia, most of our cemeteries are located close to the, close to the coast. So it means that in St. Lucia, when somebody dies now, we no longer say RIP, we say SIP, sleep in peace. SIP will now mean swim in peace or sink in peace because that is what will probably be happening to your bones as the water moves in. It's really the stark morbid reality that we're facing. So climate change is an equal opportunity to destroy. It doesn't care whether you're alive or you're dead, it will get you. There'll be more frequent flooding, there'll be longer droughts, there will be greater water insecurity. And for countries like Barbados, that also have to contend with sea level rise, which will mean your aquifers will become more saline. It means that the, 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 the groundwater sources that you rely on, you will not be able to rely on them because they'll become brackish. Um, ocean temperatures will increase as they are already increasing. You will also have ocean acidification. What many people don't realize is that when we speak of sinks, the, the places that the things that capture carbon dioxide, very often we speak, we think of our trees, but our oceans are also big sinks for carbon dioxide. And chemistry 101, carbon dioxide mixes with water, it forms something called carbonic acid. That's what happens in the ocean. As carbonic acid is formed, our oceans become more acidic. As our oceans become more acidic, it means corals can't grow as well. So the corals that provide that rich, vibrant life that our tourists like to dive in, but also provide the environment, the ecosystem that a lot of our marine life thrives in, those corals will start dying off. Also, as the oceans become more acidic, the, the shellfish that depend on a particular pH, a particular acidity to develop their shells, so things like lobsters and, and, um, and um, shrimp and conch, they won't be able to form shells. So if you're a pescatarian like me and you don't eat meat, then this is a very serious problem that you'll have to deal with. And even if you're not a pescatarian, but you just love seafood, um, it will be a, a problem to deal with. Food insecurity will become a bigger problem because both our marine and our land-based food systems will be impacted. You have hotter temperatures, you have greater water insecurity, you have ocean acidification, you have um, more extreme temperatures for your, your oceans. So you're affecting both your, your land-based and your water-based food systems. More heat waves, we're already experiencing that. And if the slides that I presented before on how every month has been the hottest year didn't drive that home, then um, and the WHO has predicted that between 2030 and 2050, climate change will cause roughly one quarter of a million more deaths. And the cost on the health sector will be between two and four billion dollars a year by 2030. That's quite significant. And if emissions continue at the rate that they're going, in India, by the end of the century, we'll have one million more heat deaths per year in India. So heat, deaths from heat will actually surpass death from infectious diseases in India by the end of the century, if emissions continue at the rate that they're going. Forests and bushfires will increase, and we only have to see what's happening right now in Australia, in Sydney, New South Wales, also in Africa. Africa is an untold story that nobody's paying attention to, but there are many forest fires going on in Africa and in parts of, of South America. Um, and that, of course, will have serious health implications. You have more particulate matter, you have all this ash in the air. So people who have respiratory problems, people who, have, who are asthmatic, will now have to be dealing with conditions that are very unfriendly. Um, when the Lancet put this report out, I think it was in 2009, it identified climate change as the biggest health threat of the 21st century. And that really hasn't changed. Um, climate change, Scientific American recently put out, put out an article speaking about the widespread health impacts that climate change is having, particularly on the vulnerable, on elderly, the sick, on children. It is victimizing the vulnerable very, very significantly. Waterborne disease, vector-borne diseases, so chikungunya, Zika, malaria, um, dengue, are all likely to increase. Although the, the, the scientific information is still being compiled, but it is very likely that this will increase. And there's another very curious thing about mosquitoes. They bite more as the temperature increases. The biting frequency of mosquitoes increases as the temperature increases. So you have now disease, you have either a, a, a protozoan parasite in the case of malaria, um, plasmodium, or you have viruses in the case of dengue, Zika, chikungunya, um, now spreading further because the temperatures are warmer, but you also have mosquitoes that are biting more frequently and with more intensity. So that is a mosquito on steroids with a virus that is not good news. Um, 
more stress-related problems. I worked in Dominica for six months after Hurricane Maria. And I can tell you, every time there was a pending weather system, the, the, you, could, you could feel the trauma ex, um, manifesting itself once again. People started panicking because the experience of first Erica and then Maria was still so fresh in their minds. And that is something that people always have to live with, um, both during the, the, the weather event and after the weather event. And that will cause there will be serious implications for on mental health and mental wellness as a result of these. Think of a farmer who's had to, and we've seen it in St. Lucia very often, for periods of the year, just have to abandon his farm because there's just not enough water. And the impact that has on his own livelihood and his ability to feed his children. These are simple things that we don't pay attention to, but these are the ways in which climate change is already affecting people's health and wellness and their state of well-being. Climate change will increase the intensity of storms because as our oceans become warmer, there's more energy for them to feed off. So this is a hurricane history. I went onto the NOAA website and, and did a graphic of hurricanes that have passed through the region. And of course, my, my computer didn't have the processing power to, so it kind of broke down halfway through because it just could not process all of these storms that have come off the African coast. And this is without climate change. So think of now this intensifying and you're having storms that are going from a category one to a category five plus plus in the space of 24 hours and what that means. What it means is this, this is Dominica, or this, the BVI, or this, Puerto Rico, Barbuda, St. Martin, the Bahamas. That can be any one of us. It can be any one of us tomorrow. It can be any one of us at any point in time. And not even Trinidad and Tobago, that feels okay because we're so far south, we're a little bit insulated. No, the storm's actually now starting to track through the south. So every single island is in the path and this can be a reality that any one of us wakes up to the next morning. Um, and this shows you the impact that these storms have had on GDP. Um, and it also, Minister, it also has an impact on the, on the, the fortunes of, um, of, of, of um, political parties. In, in Jamaica, Hurricane Gilbert caused loss and damage equivalent to 365% of its GDP. In, in Grenada, Hurricane Ivan, over 200% of its GDP. What Prime Minister Skerritt did um, a few weeks ago, a week ago, is actually quite remarkable because he survived two hurricanes. Um, tropical storm Erica, 90% of its GDP damage. Hurricane Maria, 226% and he survived that, and he survived that with it. He was really an outlier when you look at what has happened. I've put Puerto Rico in there, not because I believe that there's any correlation between Puerto Rico and the United States, but I can only live in hope. Um, <laughs> and this is the only political statement I'll make it. The global cost of inaction on climate, help, this, on climate change for the Caribbean, this, this study was done in 2008, and that's before these really serious impacts started hitting. And it shows you that even back then, with what I think is dated, um, dated metrics, it shows you that the impact on the Caribbean for global inaction on climate change, which is basically what we're seeing now, um, is quite significant. And we're talking about by 2025, 5% impact on our GDP, by 2030, 2050, sorry, 10%, you could escalate all these figures because it will be a lot more than that. So the threat to small island developing states and low-lying countries like ours is quite significant. Okay, for some reason we have, yeah, we'll come back online soon. So the question really is what can we do? What should we do? And the next set of slides will speak to that. Technology is great when it works. Is it freezing again?
Right, so this is where we were, and now I've gone too far ahead, yes, and now yes. I need to bring it back. <laughs> Okay. Sorry about that. Yes, so um, what can we do? Well, we have to drastically change the way we operate at all levels, which is really the title of the presentation. It can't be business as usual. Um, we must develop resilience at the household, community, and national levels. Our water sector must be made more resilient. The water sector is one sector that is that probably will be impacted the most by climate change. Um, we're talking about anywhere between a 10 and 25% reduction in rainfall as a result of, of changes in, in temperature. And again, for a country like Barbados or a country like Antigua and Barbuda that depends on groundwater sources with sea level rise, your water sector is being impacted both, both ways. We have to invest in early warning systems. You know, there's, a, there's an old saying that a stitch in time saves nine. A report that was recently done shown that the, the benefit cost ratio of early warning systems is actually nine to one. So for every one dollar we invest in early warning systems, we save nine dollars worth of damage that is that is um, prevented. And so it really is a no-brainer to invest in early warning systems. Um, retrofit emergency shelters. Unfortunately, more and more people will need to be spending time in emergency shelters. This is actually one we did in St. Lucia when I was Minister of Responsibility for Sustainable Development, where we went in, not only did we make it more like more more likely to um, withstand a, a wind, much as a hurricane. Um, but we've put in um, solar PV panels on the roof so that there can be a continuous supply of electricity, um, rainwater harvesting, etc. We have to build resilience into the health sector, which is what today's proceedings are all about. Improve our vector monitoring and control programs. That is extremely important because we will have to deal with greater incidents of vector-borne diseases. So our vector monitoring and control programs must be brought up to standard. Um, Climate-proof our health infra infrastructure. As the minister pointed out, anytime a hurricane passes, our hospitals are really in the front line. You have people in hospitals who you can't evacuate. You can't put them in a shelter. So what do you do? You must ensure that these health centers, these hospitals, these polyclinics are able to provide a safe space for the persons who are in there. And not just the patients, but also the doctors and the nurses, because we also have to be able to accommodate the doctors and the nurses who can't go home. Because you can't have them going home and the patients being left unattended. And when they go home, there's no way they can get back to the hospital. That doesn't work. So you must find a way to, to ensure that there are comfortable or at least decent um, living spaces for your, your healthcare professionals who must attend to the, the sick during that period. Provide training in basic full seed and psychological full seed. Psychological full seed is extremely important. We undervalue and we underestimate the trauma that people go through after a storm and the impact that it has on them, the long lasting impact that it has on them. Investing in psychological full seed is extremely important. Ensure continuity of chronic care after a natural disaster. And again, the minister spoke about that. How do you ensure that when the electricity is out and Barbados Light and Power can't restore electricity, how do you keep insulin supplies refrigerated so that they, they, they don't become useless? How do you deal with people who are on dialysis and there's no electricity to the, to the hospital? How, you can't tell them, well, okay, you have to wait until electricity comes back for you to go back on dialysis. These are things that we sometimes don't think about. How do you get people who are in a, who need to get to dialysis, but the road has been blocked off because the road between their home and the hospital. So we need to know who these people are and we need to be able to prioritize getting them so we can say to the Ministry of Infrastructure, Ministry of Works, that you have to get that road clear because I know there is someone there who must have the dialysis tomorrow. And if we don't get them to the hospital, they will die. 
It, these are the things that, these are the ways we have, we have to now start thinking because of what we confronted with. Um, but probably the most important one, we have to improve citizen health because a healthier citizen is a more resilient citizen. People who are healthier are better able to withstand the impacts of climate change, which is what makes the work of the Healthy Caribbean Coalition so important because the Healthy Caribbean Coalition is all based on making people healthier, cutting out the lifestyle diseases or minimizing the impact of the lifestyle diseases. And for me, there really is no better way to ensure the resilience of a Caribbean society than ensuring that you have a healthy Caribbean society. Consume less meat. Um, I'm not saying go vegetarian. I know it's difficult. For it, it took me a while before I actually cut out meat entirely from my diet. Um, and I'm not saying to anyone that they should do it, but I think at least eat one or two fewer meat meals a day. Not only is it healthier, but that you're also saving the environment because when we speak of greenhouse gases, we're not just talking about carbon dioxide. We're talking about methane, and methane gas is a very potent greenhouse gas, and methane gas is produced by livestock. So. Um, the, the, the less methane gas that's being produced. I remember when we were doing the negotiations for the Paris Agreement, the head of delegation for Antigua, Argentina came up to me and said, I'm very sympathetic with you small island developing states, but you must understand what 1.5 degrees Celsius means for me and my country. You're actually saying that we need to cut back on greenhouse gas emissions, which means that my country has to stop relying on the production of livestock for its economy. So these are very serious issues that, that have to be dealt with, but I think we can play our own part there. Um, Plant more trees, trees absorb carbon dioxide. Um, support local business. Reduce on the carbon footprint of the products that you buy. A product that is made in Barbados or is made in Trinidad, really the carbon footprint of it is a lot smaller than a product that was made in the United States or China and has to be shipped across using shipping um, or air freight to get into your country. So the more you support local business, it's something that we don't really pay attention to, but the more you support local business is the more you support the environment because you're reducing on the carbon footprint of your trade and industry. So Minister, I think that's a message you need to get to your Minister of Trade and Industry, that that is one way to, to, to develop a, a good buy local campaign because it's good for the environment. Um, turn off your car instead of idling. There's some cars that do that automatically now, but if you're in traffic for a long time, turn it off. It's also going to save you money because you're burning less gas, where you're putting less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So it's a, it's a better environment and it's, it's, um, it's good for you. Invest in energy if, e efficient equipment and devices. Barbados is one of the Caribbean leaders in, in solar water heaters, but we now need to make that Barbados and the Caribbean being the leaders in solar photovoltaic panels on rooftops, distributed generation, so that we can now start generating our own electricity. Um, the Caribbean, as the minister said, is a negligible, negligible contributor to global greenhouse gases. We contribute 0.166%, one sixth of 1% to global greenhouse gases. But we're the ones who are suffering the most. But it, what it does do, it makes our case even stronger. It gives us more moral authority when we go to the international community and we see a country like Barbados that contributes, I think Barbados' contribution is 0.008% of global greenhouse gases. It's committing to going carbon neutral by the year 2020 or 2030. And really, what are you doing? You're the Russians and the Chinas and the Indias and the United States of America who are really the major culprits in this. So it strengthens our voice. It gives us more moral authority. Not only that, it insulates us from the ups and downs of the global oil market. And it means that your, all of your economies will become more competitive. Unplug and use electronics. We don't pay attention to this, but we believe that because we've taken off our cell phone, we are no longer consuming power. You are. So unplug it, switch it off, unplug it. Um, because again, the good thing about these things is that you end up saving money. So not only is it good for the environment, but it's also good for your pocket. And that's, that's always a, a good combination. Fix all leaking faucets. Every drop of water you save is a drop of water that will be required during the dry season. And again, you're spending less money. Capture, store, and use rainwater for on, all non-potable needs. I was a minister of responsibility for water, and it, it grieved me that the water and storage company in St. Lucia would invest in money to capture water at a water source, pump that water to a treatment plant, spend a lot of money treating that water, pump that water to someone's home, and then they would promptly flush that water down a toilet. Now, that makes no sense or they would use that water to wash their car or to irrigate the garden when there's a lot of rainwater. So let's use our rainwater for non-portable uses and let's use the water that's produced by the water company for cooking and, and, and drinking. Use a reusable water bottle. I, I hate to say this, um, but really there's no difference between the bottled water that you're buying and the water that your water company is producing. Um, it's just more convenient to have a plastic water bottle. Well, 
get a reusable water bottle, because in doing that, you're saving the environment, you're also saving yourself quite a bit of money. Reduce, reuse, recycle, that's uh, an obvious one. I don't know that I need to elaborate more on this. Design buildings that reduce on the need for artificial heating and cooling. There's also a health impact of that. In St. Lucia and in many of our Caribbean countries, we have many sick buildings. But the reason we have sick buildings is because the buildings are all closed up with air conditioned units running, a lot of moisture, the air conditioned units can't be maintained, so you have mold buildup. When we, ha we live in a country, we live in a region where there's an abundance of sunlight, there is pretty good breeze. I was sitting in the, in the, in the dining room here today and I, I could have kept my jacket on. You know, yet we feel the need to close up and air condition everywhere, but we also feel the need to dress up this way. Now, I would, I love dressing up in a coat and tie, but if I didn't have to, I'd be even happier. So let's make, let's have a culture that is more environmentally friendly and more culturally appropriate. And, and again, it's good for our environment. Um, public education sensitization is extremely important. We need to preach, preach, preach. We need to get that message out. What is happening today is so very important. What the Healthy Caribbean Coalition is doing, what the Lancet Countdown is doing, that is so very important. But we need to get more advocates. They're still, we're still talking to ourselves, and we need to get more of our young people, more of our, we need to get people to understand that, yes, okay, getting a job and dealing with healthcare, these things are important, but this is also important. It's not one or the other. Um, make greater use of our elders. In Dominica, one of the things they found was that the houses that were built using traditional methods withstood the hurricanes much better than the houses built using new methods. So clearly our elders knew something about withstanding extreme weather events that we have discarded. So we need to go back to, to citizen science, so to speak. Um, Intensify the pressure on developed countries to curb the emissions of greenhouse gases. Right now, we are on track for a three degrees Celsius world. Not 1.5, not two degrees. The pledges that are on the table with the Paris Agreement and the policies that are in place by countries will have us at three degrees Celsius, best case scenario by the end of this century. That will be catastrophic. I showed you what two degrees Celsius would mean. Three degrees Celsius would mean a complete reconfiguration of the landscape in Barbados and many of our countries. That is not a world that you or I want to live in. Um, COP25 was a major disaster of leadership. Uh, the global leaders really did not rise to the occasion, um, even when civil society and young people were clamoring for action, we have to step up our advocacy. We have to, we have to make this a much bigger fight than it is because really we're fighting for our survival right now. When we say climate change is an existential threat, it really is. And the Lancet Countdown indicated that climate change will impact the health of every child that is born today. That is not a legacy that we want to be passing on to our children. We are supposed to pass on a world that is as good as or better than the world we inherited from our parents. We're passing on a country, a region, and a planet that are worse than what we inherited from our parents. And that's not what we want to be known for for the next generation. Einstein said that we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking that created the problems. And, and that really is what we need to move away from. And what the Lancet also said um, a few years after saying that that climate change was the biggest global health threat of the 21st century was that tackling climate change was probably the biggest global opportunity, global health opportunity of the 21st century. If we tackle it, it can help us deal with so many problems. And there are funds available for us to deal with the climate change issue. Let's tap into these funds and let's completely revitalize our health sector. Let's change the way in which we operate. Let's change our modus operandi and let's create a Caribbean that really is better for all of us. Thank you very much. Absolutely outstanding uh, presentation and view, view on the subject. You know, and even as we meet here today, the international press is reporting that in Moscow there is no snow. A day when there ought to be loads and loads of snow, very, very relevant to this discussion. Before I move on to introduce our next presenter, let me recognize the presence of the Honorable Trevor Prescott, Minister of Environment and National Beautification in Barbados. Welcome. <laughs> and, and even as I welcome the Minister, uh, uh, and Minister Bostic knows me very well, I can't, I, I, I know that it would be very difficult for me to resist this. Ministers, you have been forewarned. By the, pre by the presenter as it relates to the impact of climate events 
on your long-term sustainability. <laughs> be, be, be forewarned, as, be forewarned, as we say. But on, a more, but on a more serious note, it now gives me great pleasure to uh, invite and introduce Dr. Joyce and John. Joy is executive director of, the, of CARFA. Prior to joining CARFA, Dr. St. John held the post of Assistant Director General at the World Health Organization with direct responsibility for climate and other determinants of health. Joy was also the first Caribbean person to chair the executive board of the WHO from 2012 to 2013. And over a period of 10 years or more, she was in fact chief medical officer here in Barbados. It's a real pleasure now to invite Dr. St. John to speak to us on climate change and health. Thank you, Sir Trevor. Um, protocol having been observed, I will just greet the honorable ministers and thank them for their presence. And I'll start off right away. Now, let me tell you that I have fewer slides. And the other thing that I want to say is that the perfect system is not perfect. I just want to give you a few insights into why historically and geographically this is the best place that this launch could have happened. In 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit, small island developing states were recognized as having particular social, economic and environmental vulnerabilities. These were acknowledged in formulating Agenda 21, the non-binding action plan for sustainable development that was a result of the Rio Earth Summit in 1994 with the Barbados Plan of, Program of Action, BPOA. Specific actions were agreed upon to enable small island developing states to achieve sustainable development. And in 2005, the Mauritius strategy sought to address gaps in the Barbados Program of Action. In September 2014, the Samoa Pathway, prescribed at the third international conference on small island developing states held in Apia, Samoa, recognized the challenges of SIDS with respect to climate change and addressed issues of economic development, sea level rise, and food management, among other challenges. And so, let us hone down on the issue of climate change and health. And this gives you some insights into the climate drivers, the social and behavioral context, the environmental and institutional context, and the exposure pathways that link health to climate change. Because health and climate change are not usually linked and I'm going to give you an exposition over these few short minutes of why it is very important that we are focusing on health and climate change. In 2015, WHO said that climate change is the greatest threat to global health in the 21st century. And this was referred to in the previous presentations in the context of climate change overall. So what are some of the issues that link climate change and health? Well, have a look at this slide. Up here on the left, is, this, is there a pointer, Dr. Fletcher? Okay, well, let me go over. That's a direct impact of a hurricane on banana plants. And over on the bottom left-hand corner, what you're looking at is someone trying to make a living post-impact, selling vegetables and actually sitting in water, that stagnant water that has been left after a hurricane. So we've got issues of shortages of fresh foods. In, a few, in the first few days, hygienic conditions in shelters are suboptimal. 80 to 90% reduction in forest coverage, and there's some actions that we need to have in place, and we don't always have them in place. 
some assistance in monitoring environmental conditions so this kind of thing doesn't go on. And the regulation and inspection of agricultural vendors, supermarkets, and food establishments. There's also the issue of the impacts on safe drinking water and sanitation. And you would have seen similar um, uh, slides in the previous presentation, but we have cuts in water supply and the risk of exposure to sewage as water and sewage pipes can be compromised. The accumulation of waste stagnant water resulting from damaged infrastructure, the risk of vector-borne disease. And I know there was a reference to the whole issue of malaria, but thank goodness the malaria vector is not widespread in the Caribbean. And it's very uh, carefully monitored where it is. The need for water sanitation and health and the whole issue of mass distribution of water sanitation tablets Yes, we were um, hearing about community mobilization, but there is also the need to educate people. And of course, the testing of water quality, and I'm putting in a little plug for my Environmental Health and Sustainable Development uh, Division of the Caribbean Public Health Agency. Further, we do have uh, studies which show that post hurricanes, we do have an increase and in uptick in infectious diseases, gastroenteritis, increased fever. Fever cases rose rapidly up, up for two weeks after hurricanes, sometimes because of these conditions. But there's also the effect on our marine life. A lot of us focus on um, sargassum and the effects on tourism, but how many of us are really looking at the harmful algal blooms? Those Odd colors are the result of global warming, increasing the, the um, algal blooms, and we can have a health exposure pathways through water sports, air quality. And there is also the effect on the food and water quality. We're linking climate change and NCDs here. So if you've got an algal bloom that includes uh, the algae that causes cicatera causes poisoning, we can have direct effects on health if there's consumption of the affected marine life, the fish. But there are also economic impacts and economic losses from climate-related events relative to GDP. These are displayed in the Lancet 2019. And what we have here, the blue bars are the effects of lack of insurance and the gray bars at the bottom are the losses due to insured um, elements. But look how much greater the blue bars are and look at the effects on GDP. So this is a space that has quite a few players and we had a reference to that. But on the left, these are all the players, apart from my institution, of course, we have the Pan American Health Organization, the Caribbean Meteorological Organization, among others. And there are also regional frameworks. The minister would have referred to the third global conference on health and climate change. That was one of three conferences that linked all of the small island developing states around the world. And so the small island developing states have a common baseline with a ministerial stamp because ministers of health were heavily involved, including the minister who is sitting here in the production of these action plans. So their action plans are outlined what the countries see as their priorities. And there's work that therefore can go forward in terms of attracting funding. But there was a reference to the whole idea of how do we deal with these threats, these risks. And I want to show you something tangible, and this is the work of the Pan American Health Organization. On the left, we have damage that was sustained to the Princess Margaret Hospital Laboratory in Dominica two years ago. But on the right is the La Plaine Health Center, and this was actually smarted. I found out that this is a new verb, which is, which is the, 
which is a combination of being safe and being green. And even though there was a hurricane that was severe enough to cause that damage because of the smarting through the uh, support of the, Pan the Pan American Health Organization, we actually have health centers that can withstand those kinds of conditions. So there's work going on. This is work of one of our partners. And here is another set of work and this whole issue of data and evidence. And this is a climate smart tool developed and disseminated through a collaboration between CARFA, PAHO again, and the Caribbean Institute of Metrology and Hydrology. This is the latest bulletin, and I'm giving you some insider information. Until February 2020, there's a forecast for a dry season with increased potential for wildfires, short and long-term drought, potential extensive crop damage due to crop damage or loss, uh, food insecurity, again, if we're linking health and climate change, increased humid humidity, which may promote more growth the thing that you see in sick buildings. So there's actually a collaboration which gives you some insight into what can be happening and what are the health impacts because of the climate um, effects in the Caribbean. So what's CARFA's role? So on the right hand side, you see some pictures of the group that went to support the Bahamas during the, the recent disaster of, of Hurricane Dorian. It's a multi-sectoral group, but we do environment monitoring, environmental assessments and environmental auditing, emergency response, which is this, and of course, vector-borne disease management. But we also have produced, as we are mandated to produce, an annual state of public health in the Caribbean. And the current issue that is out, which was launched in June 2019, was on climate change, climate and health, averting and responding to an unfolding health crisis. So I advise that you can have a look and get more insight into the data which exists in the Caribbean about climate change and health. So I end now with a quote, sometimes later becomes never, do it now. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and work with us as we do it now. Thanks very much, Dr. Thanks very much, Dr. St. John. It's quite clear that uh, CAFO with Dr. St. John's leadership is playing an important role in this topic in the region. Our final speaker before I introduce uh, Dr. Nick Watts of the, the Executive Director of Lancet Countdown is Dr. Georgiana gordon Strawn. Uh, Georgiana uh, currently works at the Caribbean Institute for Health Research, the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. Uh, she's a very active researcher, in fact, with current research interests that include epidemiology, health policy, and health services research. Dr. Gordon Strawn was recently a recipient of a Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies Award for Excellence in Research, a very unique distinction. And in that regard, it's a real pleasure to invite Dr. Gordon Strawn to address us on climate change and health research in the Caribbean. Thank you very much, Sir Trevor Hassel. All protocols observed, ministers, I acknowledge you. Friends, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present today. I know that I'm standing between you and the most important presentation of the day, so I will try to be as brief as I can. So I want to start by saying that the Caribbean is no, we're no novices. We're not novices when it comes to research, and the minister alluded to that earlier, a recent publication in October 2019. So I, in my presentation, I'm just going to highlight a few of the research uh, 
papers that we have done, and I have to say that I selected them randomly and then deleted a few and I realized that I only had 10 minutes to present. So I'm going to go through really quickly. So the very first one that I could find that actually had the word climate in it and had something to do with health was a paper done in 1976 by Professor Graham Sargent and his colleagues and it, looks at, it looked at uh, the impact of climate and painful crisis in patients with sickle cell disease. This was a 10-year retrospective study and showed a close correlation between low temperatures and hospital admissions for severe crises in sickle cell disease. The next, which I think is poignant to what we're doing today, looks at development biology, but also at extreme events. And this is a study which was done right after Hurricane Gilbert, and um, it was done by Dr. Doff and Dr. Cooper. It looked at neural tube defects in Jamaica following Hurricane Gilbert. This, I think, is a very important paper because what they saw was an increase in spina bifida, which occurred about 11 to 18 months after Hurricane Gilbert. And this temporary increase in incidence was attributed to a reduction in dietary intake of folate in the periconceptional period just after the hurricane. Um, this is because uh, right after the hurricane, there was a reduction in fresh foods and fresh, veg fresh fruits and vegetables and therefore a decline in normal folate intake. So this is a direct connection between development biology and extreme event and um, neural tube defects. Now, I couldn't stand here, and those of you who know Professor Chaddy wouldn't forgive me if I stood here without mentioning his work. His work has been pioneering. Um, he was one of the first, along with some of his other colleagues, to look at the Aedes aegypti mosquito and the spread of dengue and its correlation with weather variability in the Caribbean. This, I think, was his last paper, and this looked at the adaptation of the Aedes aegypti in the Caribbean. And he post postured in this paper some suggestions for how we might change our vector-borne control, um, our vector control program. The minister alluded to this earlier, so I will just say quickly that we have been involved in mathematical modeling and some work commissioned by the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology looked at nonlinear and delayed impacts of climate on dengue risk in Barbados. And this was a modeling study. And this is in process, in train, to help with fine tuning or early warning systems for dengue. Like Dr. St. John um, alluded to earlier, I wanted to show that we do have work which we've moved from research into climate products. And this example is for Sahara dust. If you go on the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology website, you're able to get a seven day dust prediction of Sahara dust. And um, does this have a pointer? So, okay, here. And I just want you to pay attention to the date here. It's the 22nd of the 12th, so I'm being a bit futuristic. So this is what we might expect. <laughs> so this is what we might expect right here. It's Africa and the Sahara dust um, flowing across. And right here we have the Caribbean. So we can use this to help to monitor and predict what respiratory conditions we might have and how our admissions may change as a result of this. So I want to spend just a few more minutes looking at what I consider are the gaps in research and some future considerations for research in climate and health. Now I know that I'm preaching to the choir when I'm talking about NCDs, but I wanted to just draw your attention to two things. Um, this slide looks at secular trends among people with um, among the 15 to 74 years age group, this is a nationally representative survey called the Jamaica Health and Lifestyle Survey. And the last iteration of the survey was in 2017. Now pay attention to this figure right here. What we've noted with the survey is between 2001 and 2017, there has been a prevalence change of 50.7% in 
hypertension. So basically hypertension has increased by 50.7%. Obesity trailing not too far behind at 46.7%. So for me, the first gap in our research is how do we tackle NCDs and climate? We need more, I think we need to do more research which probes this relationship. And one way of doing this, I think, would be to set up a climate and health observatory where we look at patterns of hospital admissions for chronic diseases, mental health and trauma, and relate these to variability in our weather. The second gap is heat stress on a tropical island. I think there's a general assumption that tropical dwellers can withstand high temperatures, but climate change will bring unprecedented heat. And we're unsure of how this might actually affect us physiologically. You will recall that your normal body temperature is a very narrow range, around about 36 degrees Celsius. So if we heat up to a lot more than that, what kind of effect will it have on us? And is it okay to just assume that since we're adapted to a warmer climate, we will survive? I think this is something that we need to probe. Access to good nutrition. We're expecting increase to drought, so we expect that that will bring food insecurity. The Caribbean has been really good at reducing severe malnutrition. We're, we're so good at it that at the University Hospital of the West Indies, where we had a ward, for children with severe malnutrition, we had to close the ward because we no longer have that problem. And I think that that is probably the same for many of our other Caribbean neighbors. However, will we be seeing a re-emergence of malnutrition with an expected increase in food insecurity? So I think we need to have a look at what, are the prob what is the probability of this re-emergence and how do we prepare ourselves for it? But with that, also look at the levels of micronutrient deficiencies, which may also result as, um, as, a, prob as a result of, of food insecurity and climate change. We've not really looked so much as, at our food quality. With droughts, we know we will have smaller yields, but it's the quality and quantity of our nutrients also. Are those compromised? I think we need to look at that. We've been doing um, some mathematical modeling and we've been trying to set up early warning systems. This is a big push for the Caribbean. However, our biggest problem hasn't benefited as much from the research that we've done in terms of developing early warning systems. So I think we also have to look back at how we tackle chronic diseases in light of this. I alluded to development biology earlier, and um, it was interesting that both Dr. St. John and the previous speaker from Solorion um, spoke about the impact of an extreme event. What we need to do is we really do need to look at doing some cohort studies of children who had these early life exposures to extreme events. Anecdotally, the cohort of children born during Hurricane Gilbert in Jamaica have not done as well in standardized tests as the children who were born before or born after. So this is an important group that we need to identify and possibly expose them to stimulation programs which have been shown to have sustained benefits. We can't move forward unless we strengthen our health system. So these are just some ideas. I'd like to applaud Barbados for setting up uh, solar energy to power their health facilities and the rest of the Caribbean would like to learn from you. So I think this is an opportunity to do some research to show us in implementation research, how can we, is this good for everybody? Who is it good for? And how might this actually be used to power some of our, our larger systems? As you know, hospitals are great users of energy with uh, machines like MRIs and CT scans and so on. Uh, the other thing that I think we need to look at is the role of technology. I think most of our countries still actually use paper-based medical record systems. Uh, we, and, and I've been to many of the medical records offices. They are prone to flooding and usually in some basement of the hospital. <laughs> so we need to look at that for continuity of care. But we also need to explore the use of technology digitizing these records. And in, as a researcher, 
in that process include systems for data collection, monitoring, and enhancing our research capability. Our pharmaceuticals, um, our disease modeling will inform us on whether or not we need to re-examine and redefine our pharmaceutical needs. And this is something that we will we'll need to have a look at. Also the quality of pharmaceuticals, of our pharmaceuticals, for example, those with, um, which are usually stored on open shelves, are they still as potent? Are they still as efficacious as we expect them to be having been exposed to higher temperatures? So we need to look at that. Um, extreme events. I have put here that, um, and I'm just focusing on what I've highlighted, which is that research on the effect of extreme events on the exacerbation of chronic, of chronic diseases and chronic conditions really needs to be looked at. And I think we have the data. I think we can do this. We can do it retrospectively, but as we do it retrospectively, we can build out so that we can keep monitoring prospectively. We should go backwards and forwards. So I'm almost at the end. I'd like to leave, I'd like to leave on a positive note. I'd like to leave on the note that we have the capability. Dr. St. John's, uh, I think your second to last slide showed all the agencies in the Caribbean which are dealing with climate. And I think the capacity for climate modeling. We have the Climate Studies Working Group in Mona and other groups within the Caribbean. The five Cs also does some climate modeling we actually have real-time meteorological data. CIMH, or the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology, have improved a number of weather stations regionally, and these are data that we're collecting in real time. And for many of our countries, we also have historical weather data, which we can use to do um, some mathematical modeling and trend analyses to see what we might be able to predict. We have a good surveillance system, but the surveillance system is particularly good for infectious diseases. I think we need to look at how we improve our surveillance system for chronic non-communicable diseases. Okay, um, we do have some administrative data on chronic diseases um, in registries. Uh, Barbados has a good registry and there are several other countries who are building on the same model that Barbados has developed. But this is an area which I think we have to look at what are the building blocks. So for climate, we have climate. For health, we have, but it's not organized in a way that is easily utilized. So my second to last slide, um, I couldn't sit without saying, we need to improve and increase our research capacity. As a researcher, I will sing that song forever. And as I was talking to Professor, to Sir Trevor Hassel earlier, he said, when you're a practitioner, you rarely see the benefits. You rarely see the gaps. And I think as a practitioner, I can relate to that. So I think we need to look at quantifying our future risks. And I think like the Lancet said, that there are opportunities to implement changes that will definitely reap long-term goals. And again, in the face of these uncertainties, research will certainly help to direct the decisions that we need to take now. I close with the father of medicine, Hippocrates, and his quote, whoever would study medicine aright must learn of the following subjects. First, he must consider the effect of the season of the year and the differences between them. Secondly, he must study the warm and the cold winds, both those which are in common to every country and those which are peculiar to a particular locality. Thank you. So we now come to uh, the presentation, if you will, by Dr. Nick Watts, who is Executive Director of the Lancet Kongdong. Nick is a medical doctor with training in population health and public policy with over a decade uh, of experience in health and climate change. He's led the Lancet Kongdong collaboration in 2012. He's therefore well positioned uh, to share uh, his experience and to make this presentation. 
Nick has worked in global public health with the WHO, Royal Medical Colleges, and the NHS Sustainable Development Unit. It is a real pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Nick Watts to address the report. Nick. Hello. Who said good morning? <laughs> Hello, sir. It's a dangerous thing to give an Australian a microphone this loud and this close, so I will take a step back. I'm very sorry. I'm also very sorry if you can't understand my accent. No one understands my accent except for the Australians and a couple of New Zealanders, but no one really cares much about the New Zealanders. <laughs> So Trevor, I have, I have three hours, is that right? I have, I have three hours, we will all go, we'll have a drink, then we come back and I have another two hours, I think. Yeah, yeah. Honorable Minister, old friends, joy. New friends to Trevor, and friends that I don't think we've yet met, but we'll have time sometime soon. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much for having the Lancet Countdown um, here. We are really, really excited about the launch of the 2019 report, but particularly about today. Um, I'm going to talk through and explain a little bit about why today is so important to us um, in particular, because there are some vulnerabilities, there are some exposures, there are some health outcomes, and there are some responses that we share in common across the world when we face climate change, but there are some that are so unique to small island states, so unique to the Caribbean. Um, and I think we need help understanding those and understanding how we can help respond. So, this is us. We do a pretty simple thing. Once a year, we publish a report. The report puts a finger on the pulse of the planet. It tries to track the emerging health profile of our changing climate. Climate change, public health, as far as I'm concerned, is by far the biggest global health threat. It's the threat that undermines every single aspect of all of the social determinants of health, all of the environmental determinants of health. The health systems, the doctors, the nurses that we built and trained, they were built, they were trained for a stable climate. They weren't built to respond to some of the health challenges that we're gonna be facing in the future, to some of the health challenges that we are facing now. So if this is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century, we did what every sensible sort of public health emergency needs. It needs a report. Every public health emergency needs a report. So we got academics and we put them in a basement where academics should go. We produced reports and we produced graphs because if you have a public health emergency, you need academics, you need reports and you need graphs, no? Yes. And we started where all good research starts. Well, we started at University College London. This is where we began quite a few years ago. But pretty quickly we realized, the Australian realized, that climate change is a global problem. And so we had to go and start to find some new friends. We found them in China, in Tsinghua University and in Umia in Sweden. We found some troublemakers in the World Health Organization some other troublemakers in the Australians. And then pretty soon we needed a bigger basement. The Lancet Countdown, we're a collaboration of 35 institutions scattered across the world. We cover every continent, but if you look closely, you'll notice that there's a couple of gaps that we have there in terms of the expertise that we have and in terms of the geographical sort of spread that, we, that we're able to cover. So we grab all of those academics, we put them in a basement, we ask them to produce some reports. And every good report, I think, needs a good graph. So we made a graph, we had another graph. We had a lot of data that we pulled together. Some people say we have too much data. Some people say we make too many graphs. I, I may be one of those people. Some people say that our graphs are almost impossible to understand. 
I may be one of those people as well. <laughs> we do a simple thing. We track indicators of the links between public health and climate change. Anything from exposures and vulnerabilities to extreme weather, to heat wave, to flood, to drought, to storms, through to the vectorial capacity for the transmission of dengue fever, of malaria, of vibrio, of vibrio cholera. We look at health systems and we ask, how are those health systems responding? Do we have plans in place? Are we beginning to implement those plans? Have we funded those plans? And we look outside of the health system because it turns out that this problem, it tackles, it, it approaches health, it undermines health across every sector. So we ask questions of the power generation sector. We look at the transport sector, we look at agriculture. And we look at the health effects of all of those responses because if we are gonna tackle climate change, we're not just tweaking around the edges, we are transforming the entire way that we run our communities, our societies and our health systems. And if we're gonna do that, we have one opportunity to get that right. And we have one opportunity to make sure that we maximize the health benefits as we do put health at the center. We track the economics and the finance of the problem, and we track the public and the political engagement. It's a really long report. Um, I genuinely wouldn't recommend you read all of it. Um, there's an executive summary. Um, it's very nice. There are two or three pages there. You can, you can read that. But maybe to save you a little bit of time, there are two things I'd like, I'd like everyone to take away from this year's report. Number one. We think we're at a turning point. We think just recently we've hit a turning point where the life of a child born today, born 19th of December, 2019, their life will be affected by climate change at every single stage as they grow up, unless we take urgent action. We talked about 1.5 degrees. We talked about two degrees. We talked about sort of current policies hitting around three, 3.2 degrees. I, I think that's optimistic. I think we are not just sleepwalking, but sprinting into a four degree world. And it scares me. It scares me because of the impact that has on kids under the age of six months old, what malnutrition does and the permanent cognitive effects, the permanent cardiovascular gastrointestinal effects that stay with them through their entire life. And the fact that we have seen just up to present day, a 4% decline in global yield potential for the major crops that we track, rice, maize, spring, wheat and winter wheat. As you track that child through to age five, we know that kids under the age of five, they are among the most susceptible to, this, to the sequelae, to the health consequences of dengue fever. And we know that nine out of the 10 most suitable years globally for the transmission of dengue occurred in the last 20 years. Going forward into adulthood, that kid at some point is gonna to wanna to buy a house. They're gonna start a family and they're gonna to have to contend with wildfires in Australia and the economic impacts that that brings, the fact that 77% of countries have experienced a drastic increase in exposure to wildfires over the last 25 years. They're gonna to have to contend with Hurricane Maria, with Hurricane Dorian, and the effects that that has, not just when it hits once, but when it comes back again and again and again, and it starts to wear away, when climate change starts to wear away at community resilience, at health systems that used to be the anchor of what brought a community together. And that child is gonna grow into old age. And we know that around the world, 2019, we saw 220 million people, additional people exposed to extremes of heat. And importantly, these 220 million people, that's, just not, that's not just sort of young, fit uh, Australians that look a lot like Hugh Jackman. Well, you didn't have to laugh. <laughs> that 220 million, those are people who are vulnerable, people aged over 65 years of age, people with chronic kidney disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes, people who are in urbanized and low income settings. Um, and that's when something that becomes just a little bit of heat turns into something that's fatal. We saw before about the idea of a million deaths in India by 2050. That's just a business as usual scenario. That's not the worst case scenario. So taking a quick look at what that might look like here and all the data that we have, we, for the first time, we're really excited have managed to take all of our data and throw it up online. Um, we have a new data platform that anyone can access. It helps you figure out what is happening for each of our indicators across all of the countries that we're able to track. We're really excited because we hope it means that it's useful. We hope that it means that this turns into something that is more than just a report. But if we draw out just a couple of the countries that this region might be interested in, and we look at, for example, heat vulnerability indexes, 
we see that across the Caribbean, heat vulnerability is rising, and that's concerning because so is heat exposure. And as that does, if we're not prepared, we start to see mortality, morbidity, sprint as well. Looking at the vectorial capacity for dengue fever. Now, this is an incidence. It's not, it's not sort of case presentations. What we're trying to do here is isolate the climate signal. Dengue spreads for many, many reasons. It spreads because of trade. It spreads because of um, urbanization. What we're doing here is tracking the climate signal that's driving that. We can see rises across, across large parts of the Caribbean for Aedes aegypti, for Albopictus. We know that the biggest increase we think is observed in Dominica. Saw an almost 50% increase in the vectorial capacity here. Now, what's important here as well is that if you look along the x-axis, we're not talking about 2050 and we're not talking about 2100. Our data stopped in 2018, our data stopped in 2019. We are tracking health impacts, exposures, vulnerabilities. We're tracking them up to present day uh, because we think if we're gonna start uh, forming policy there, yes, we need to be doing our projections forward, but we also need to understand that climate change is not an issue that affects us in 2100 alone. It is affecting us today. And then again, when we look at food security, I've managed to cut off basically all of the useful information there, like a y-axis and a title. <laughs> but this is percentage, percentage change in, in yield potential for these countries for maize. Um, up to present day, up to 2018, this data st stops. We see roughly a 2 to 4% decline in yield potential up to present day. Now that we expect to accelerate, not at a linear rate, but we expect to accelerate exponentially as time goes on. These are some real effects that we're starting to see just across the Caribbean. So, first message, the life of every child born today is being profoundly affected by climate change. It will affect them at age six months, five years, 12 years, 65 years of age. And they will walk, they will sprint, we will sprint into a four degree world. But, and this is really important, this to me is the, is the core of what I think we need to spend our time thinking about. Whether or not we head down that pathway into a four degree world or whether or not we take advantage of the opportunities that we are presented with is a choice. We have two pathways that we can head down and we have a choice as to which one we head down. Now, it's important that I think that we, that we acknowledge that that choice perhaps is being made by a couple of countries that export one third of the world's coal, Australia, a couple of countries that undermine the negotiations in Madrid just a week or two ago, Brazil, the United States, Saudi Arabia. But there are still things that every country can do. There is absolutely a really, really important moral weight that comes from, uh, from decarbonizing in small island states, decarbonizing in low middle income countries. Um, the reason we are talking about 1.5 degrees is because of the Caribbean, because of small island states that wasn't on the table. It wasn't something that was going to be built into the Paris Agreement. And there's a moral authority there that came there and I think genuinely shifted the nature of those discussions. And there are positives. It's moving slowly, but we are starting to see shifts in health system adaptation. We are starting to see shifts in spending. 2018, we saw an 11% increase in total, in total adaptation spend for global health. This is coming from the climate change sector into health systems into public health. We work a lot with NHS England. Um, they are making large requests to try to future-proof their health systems. What's really important is that the health system is already cash-strapped. That money there is starting to come from groups like the Green Climate Fund and come from other spaces into the system to support it. And around the world, we are starting to see renewable energy take over. Now, this is a relative number, obviously, but 45% of growth in electricity generation came from renewables in 2018. That's something that we wouldn't have expected to see, you can see, just a couple of years ago. It's really exciting. And what's even more exciting is accompanying that shift in renewable energy, we are seeing it displace coal-fired power. Coal-fired power is responsible for one million deaths around the world every year. It poisons, pollutes our hearts, our lungs, our brains. These sorts of shifts, again, are not shifts that we would expect to have seen five years ago. Um, the Powering Pass Coal Alliance now has 32 countries involved. They are phasing out coal unilaterally. They're doing it in the next five years, and they're doing it because it's important for public health and it's important for climate change. We just didn't think we would see that. And there are reasons for hope, and there are reasons for optimism, and there are changes that are happening 
that I think if we're not careful, we sometimes miss, sometimes forget that global investment in coal is plummeting. <laughs> and countries are, I'm sure you can all read this, <laughs> countries are starting to recognize that there are links between climate change and links between public health. Um, what this is, we track, uh, we track political engagement, we track public engagement, we track engagement from the media in health and climate change. This in particular is looking at the uh, extent to which countries are recognizing the links between climate change and public health in their national statements to the UN General Assembly. It's increasing over time, reassuringly. If you look a little closer, what you see is that the countries that are making those links overwhelmingly, they are small island states, overwhelmingly, in fact, they come from the Caribbean, um, 10 of the top 20 um, of, the, of the countries that make that link come from the Caribbean. And I think we have something like uh, St. Kitts and Nevis uh, is, is sort of right up there, continuously again and again, making that link um, explicitly. And as you see, bringing with it other countries and other, other um, health systems. So those are my two points. Two and a half points. A child born today is running, will run, into a four degree world and experience all sorts of health impacts as a result of that. It doesn't have to be that way. We have a second pathway that we can take. That second pathway, all of those changes I was talking about, about coal fired power, about renewable energy, they lead to more resilient health systems. They lead to, uh, they lead to cleaner air, sort of healthier diets, safer cities. Really importantly, and it's not written in this report, but I think this is probably the most important thing that has stuck out to me over the, the time that we've done, done this work. We look at these health impacts and we get scared. We turn around to the engineers and the climatologists and the hydrologists that we work with and we say, why, why is this not changing fast enough? Why do we not have solar, wind? Why are we not deploying this? Is, is the technology not ready? And they say, no, Nick, no, the, the technology is ready. The technology has been there. In fact, it's cost effective. In fact, solar power is cost effective against, co against coal in every single country in the world, if you take a 10 year view. Okay, so it's not technology. Is it that it costs too much? Well, no, actually, if you consider the health benefits that you get there from cleaner air, it turns out that renewable energy is cost effective against all of its fossil fuel counterparts. You get reductions in admissions to hospital for asthma, for exacerbations of COPD, for all sorts of chronic diseases. And very, very quickly, this technology, the implementation, it pays for itself. Is it the finance? No, no, it's not the finance. In fact, what we're actually doing is putting the money in the wrong place. We are subsidizing fossil fuels. It wouldn't be hard. You could you'd do it slowly, but you could shift those subsidies and put them into renewable energy. Whether or not we head down this first pathway, a four degree world that impacts that ch child's life at every stage or this second pathway is not an engineering question. It's not a technical question. It's not an economic question. It's not a financial question. This is entirely a political question. It's a choice. It's a choice that all of us have to make every day at the individual level, at a hospital level, in our clinical decisions and all the way up to government. And so that is why We are here. We're here because we know that we have a gap. Um, we don't have the expertise that we should have um, in small island states and in the Caribbean in particular. We know that it's a area, it's a part of the world that has some unique vulnerabilities, some unique solutions and some unique contributions to offer. And it's something that I think sincerely the Lancet Countdown would like to start to fill. We reached out to some new friends um, to try to do that, but uh, we're here to learn, I think, and we're here to make sure that over the next couple of years, we can add a few more friends to this slide here and make sure that we fill that gap. Um, if we haven't been here already before, it's because we are low on resource. It's because we're just getting started. And it's because at every stage, we like to iterate, we like to adapt, and we like to build on things. Um, there are unique indicators that we don't track that would be incredibly valuable um, and specific to the Caribbean, specific to small island states across the world. Um, and we would love your help in trying to do that. Um, that's all I have. Thank you so, so much for having me. Um, it's been really fantastic.
Mr. Trevor, I hope you don't mind. I'd love to give you a copy of this report, um, uh, just to say thank you for everything. It's not a particularly special one. Everyone else will get a copy as well. <laughs> but <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Yes, go ahead, Nick. I'm sure everyone can hear my voice. Can anyone not hear my voice? Yeah, go ahead, Nick. <laughs> um, I mean, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, there are some positive messages to see on coal and investing in coal as you're planning. There are 1,730 coal plants currently planned for construction around the world. 92% of them are in China, Pakistan, and India. If all of those coal plants come online, if every single one of them come online, they will stay because the average coal plant, the average modern coal plant has a half-life of about 80 years. They'll stay online for 90 years or so. Those coal plants alone, they blow the carbon budget for the entirety of the Paris Agreement if they stay online. And when a country builds a coal plant, it doesn't shut it down because it's too costly to shut it down. You need to keep it running for 30, 40 years just because it's the cost. So I completely agree. I think one of the lowest hanging globally, one of the lowest hanging fruits we really need to hammer home is coal fire power. That for me is one of the scary things because those are locked in costs that you 
one day that uh, they don't think it's supposed to work. When it comes to NCDs, uh, I perhaps can refer to it as explicitly as I should have in my, my report. Sometimes that is because for me, they are basically the same issues. For me, all of the drivers of climate change, whether it is physical inactivity, whether it is unhealthy diets, um, whether it is air pollution and what that does to chronic lung disease, what that does to sort of heart disease, stroke, um, they are the same drivers as what drives NCDs. Um, I love that report. Um, we work with the pandemic report. We work really closely with um, with quite a few of the people there. Um, at one point, they sort of came to us and said, "Well, would you be offended if we put out this report that specifically tried to highlight the link between obesity, between NCDs, and climate change?" We said, "God no." Someone has got to start shouting about this. We've got to stop talking about these as though they are two different or three different issues and start understanding that they have the same thing. Um, I think we need to do a much better job of tracking, though, uh, physical activity changes around the world, um, tracking investment in active transport, active travel infrastructure, um, and probably really importantly, tracking uh, the link between unhealthy diets and climate change. And another indicator in the program of more than Right, right, right. So those right. food and healthy. Right. You know? so another, another common cause. Yeah, yeah. Good. The issue of syndemic is, a, is an interesting one. In another place, I made the observation that for the Caribbean, I would like to see added to, to, to the components, if you will, of the syndemic. Um, uh, accidental deaths. In, in, and crime and violence and deaths related to young people, uh, but that's a that's a whole other discussion that we can have in in another time and place. Uh, Dr. Connell, thank you, Tom. So, so hearing the presentations provoked some high level thoughts, and uh, I was quite struck by the last presenter's comments about today's child is going to be born pretty badly affected by the change in a world that largely has been obsessed in protecting this same child prior to birth. So we spend a lot of money on Caribbean mortality and maternal health and public health has focused on this. And so as one of the academics in the basement, I wanted to kind of suggest, well, what are the big rocks for academia? And, and I heard uh, Dr. Borden say, and maybe I'm incorrect, but you can clarify, are these identifying relationships, one, Proving causality to design an intervention or interventions three, and then maybe some innovation and monitoring. Is that the correct framework? And, and then what also is the role of academia in, in kind of training the, the new cadre of healthcare professionals who are not, you're right, who are not trained to, to function in a world that's mitigated by climate change. Here's, I mean, this conversation doesn't even come up. So how, what interventions can we bring about in the curriculum, hidden or otherwise, to bring about a new cadre of practitioners? Thank you. Who's going to take that up? Go ahead, uh, Georgiana. I'm not as well as Nick, I'm not Australian. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have you from <laughs> Um, I just want to say that your framework is absolutely correct. It's all of the above. Um, sometimes causality is hard to, to, to define, except maybe when we're looking at microorganisms that we can directly at, attribute to an illness. So I, I'm, uh, my training is also in epidemiology, so I'm very careful about words like causality. But absolutely, the, your framework is, is correct. Um, you spoke about academia and training the new set of practitioners, but I'd like us to go a little bit before that. And um, what I know is that many of the, I can speak for Jamaica, I have a child who is in what would be primary school, and she's very aware of climate change, she's very aware of global warming, it has been infused in their curriculum. At the other levels, the higher levels, it's, it's, it's included in the CXC syllabus as well for social studies and some of the other subjects. So it is being infused. I agree with you that at the 
higher levels of learning at our universities and colleges. It may not be as infused into the curriculum as we would like, but I do know that there are special programs, special courses that are offered at some of our universities for students, especially I know I can speak for economics and my colleague from Econ is from Cave Hill Econ is here, he can probably bear me out on this, where we have some courses where we look specifically at climate change and um, development and economic impact. <laughs> I think that that is, if you said you were going to something on water sector, they would probably, you'd probably have the same response. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're probably not good at integrating them on all the social determinants of health and uh, all the other determinants of health. Nicole? <laughs> We have to see how we can integrate and infuse um, more of our, you know, look critically at what we're teaching and, and, and infuse this climate change dimension into it to the extent possible because I think it, you know, goes even beyond the medical um, dimension, albeit that that is our focus today. Right. Yes. Just identify yourself so that we know. Sorry. Thank you very much indeed. Does that, does that no, help? Go again. Okay, it's Moni Rani DK Dames, and I really wanted to pick up on what you just said. I'm from Law as well, but I was very interested in Nick Watts and James Stewart. Both of them referred to the fact that the contribution of the Caribbean to the climate change is actually minimal, but the effects of it will be disproportionate yeah. to what they contribute. And both of them in their various ways talked about what's really required is to find a way to whether you call it moral pressure whatever it is to assert the relevant pressure on those people who have the greatest ability to effect the change that we all need and that's why I was really interested when you said you, you you're from a legal background as I am I'm a human rights lawyer and that is a way to exert pressure, real pressure, not moral pressure, mm -hmm. but real pressure on not just the states, but the companies also who contribute to this. And I wondered when, we're, when you're all sitting here and thinking about the, the effects here and what can we do, is there any thought as to how we can use the international legal system and for that matter, the national legal systems to exert that kind of pressure where it may hurt the most? as opposed to simply telling people about the effect that it's going to have here. I think you need to have an effect over there. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's, interesting. that's interesting. I don't know if anyone wishes to, to respond. I'm going to give a, a very initial comment and say that um, your observation is very, very relevant to the approach uh, are one of the major approaches of the Healthy Caribbean Coalition because uh, for the last uh, several few years now, we have been engaged in a significant way in, in trying uh, to use law to effect change as it relates to, in particular, the issue of and uh, the epidemic of childhood obesity and that, that issue caused by the excessive consumption of sugar. And so uh, certainly it is an approach that we in the Healthy Caribbean Coalition will certainly look to uh, adopt. Uh, 
uh, as it relates to, to climate change and NCDs and health. And a, a very quick comment also, one of our approaches has been to engage the youth because we, and it's for that reason, quite a few of our, of our youth advocates are, are, are here today uh, so that they begin to get a flavor of, of this approach. Yes, very important, that whole issue of the law. I'm sorry. Uh, all right, go ahead. No, it's, it's not. So one of the ways that in the Caribbean we tend to affect the law is to influence the people who make the law, which is the politicians. And you're having both the Minister of Environment and the Minister of Health in this room was key to that. And the Minister of Environment was constantly telling me about how the presentations were impacting him. And then when I walked him out, he spoke about some constructs that he wants to see in place so that Barbados can do some specific initiatives. The whole idea of the advocacy is important, but when we are talking about the law and making a law, that process may be protracted. We can look at the advocacy element, yes, but the lawmakers and how our evidence that we will produce through some of the research that you spoke about, that's going to have a quicker impact in terms of policy and programs that affect changes. Okay. I, I saw, go ahead. Okay, so we have a question from Roxanne Springer, who's watching the live stream from Canada. And she has said, I am a doctoral student and working on my thesis. My question is on multi-sectoral partnerships needed to address this issue, because as you noted, climate change is going to undermine health through sectors beyond health. Very quickly, what do you think this would look like and how is it different from now? Who wishes to answer that? That's uh, just to repeat. That's uh, someone who's watching the live stream and from Canada. Thank you. I'll actually answer that and respond to the previous question that that Nicole raised. Um, multi-sectoral approaches are extremely important. Just dealing with the issue of, of a legal response. One of the things that we grappled with during the Paris Agreement and almost derailed our discussions on getting loss and damage included in the Paris Agreement was an issue of liability and compensation. The Annex I countries, the developed countries, did not want to entertain any conversation about attributing liability to them for any of the impacts of climate change that are being felt by small island developing states and low-lying countries, and speaking of any possibility of compensation. This issue read its head again this year at COP25, where the issue of liability and compensation came up. And I said to, I, I wasn't at, at COP25, and I said to some of the negotiators there that this is something that will have to be litigated. But for it to be litigated, there must be a very rigorous body of attribution science that must underpin it so that we can say that a Hurricane Maria that impacted Dominica caused 226% of GDP worth of loss and damage could be attributed to climate change. And as a result, there is some responsibility that developed countries who are continuing to emit global greenhouse gases like the Chinas and the Indias and the United States and Russia, there is a liability that they must assume. When we were negotiating Paris, one of the, the Minister of the Environment for India said to me, I'm very sympathetic to your concerns about 1.5 degrees, but I have millions of people I need to take out of poverty. I can't do that with the approaches that you're suggesting. I need to go with the most low cost um, approach, which is to use coal. Now, I was just in Delhi two weeks ago and I, anybody who's been to India will understand what he's speaking about. So we have to be able to make that case that solar is cheaper for India than coal. Solar is also cheaper in terms of the health impacts that coal will bring to India. So I think we have to change our discussion. Speaking specifically to this question of multi-sectoral impacts, it is so important for us to make everybody understand that climate change is not an environmental issue. It's not a, it's not a, one of the big things being spoken about right now is to put a ban on air travel because now people are being shamed about flying. So stay local with your travel. So it means the Caribbean will be victimized twice. It means that people will be discouraged from flying from Europe, from the United States to the Caribbean because the, the carbon footprint of your flight is so much that they will not come. So unless we engage in all of these four, unless we make our people in the Ministry of Tourism, our people in the Ministry of Trade, our teachers, Italy just made climate change um, 
instruction mandatory at all levels of the education system. This is Italy that is not, with the exception maybe of Venice, that has been experiencing some very bad flooding recently. But Italy is still not as impacted by climate change as we are. So why are these countries, why is Greta Thunberg, the, the, the global voice on climate change, why is it not um, Jamila Seeley here in, the, here in Barbados, who's been speaking about this for the longest while? Why is it not some of our Caribbean young people? We need to make ourselves a lot more visible. We need to take this. We can't let other people be fighting our battles for us. Yes, we have to enlist them. Yes, we have to bring them on board. But I think the Caribbean, not just from our political leaders, was slowly waking up to this. And unfortunately, our Caribbean leaders see, with the exception of the Honorable Mia Motley of, of Barbados and um, Roosevelt Skerritt and, and Keith Mitchell in, in Grenada, most of our Caribbean leaders see climate change as a cash cow, something that they can go to the Green Climate Fund and ask for money for. That's not what climate change is. Climate change is something that will drastically impact life in the Caribbean. And I think we have to get that point across to everybody, from the shop worker in, 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 um, in Barbados to the politician in St. George's. And that is something, so the multi-sectoral approach is extremely important, but to proceed the multi-sectoral approach has to be education. And I yeah. don't think we're doing enough with the education. Yeah. Point well taken. Any other comments or observations? Yes, go ahead, sir. I have a question. Just identify yourself. Yeah. My name is Adriana Ston Fluchman, wash advisor, also known as the plumber for PAHO WHO. I have a question for Mr. Watt, Dr. Watt. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. You mentioned in the end that you would love to, to report on a number of health indicators for the small island states in the Caribbean. I'm curious to know what they are, and we might be able to report on them in the future. Sure. So uh, the Lancet Countdown, we, we operate. Sometimes it may look like we're a little bit opaque and it's difficult to figure out how the hell we work, but we're actually quite simple. Um, we invite anyone into the collaboration that can help us track an area that is important to health and climate change. We like to do things globally, but we acknowledge that there are unique vulnerabilities, exposures, outcomes, that are specific to certain populations um, and not everything is always going to be relevant to Perth, Western Australia, um, uh, although most things I think are, right? Um, in small island states for the Caribbean, the, two of the areas I am most interested in, I think, um, partly looking at the effects of sea level rise, um, we struggle to identify we struggle with sort of climate migration for a whole bunch of methodological reasons that I'm sure people in this room are, are familiar with. Um, it gets really, really complex when you start to talk about um, migration that comes from not just sea level rise, but from sort of loss of arable land. But some of the areas that I think are most extreme, most obvious to us are what we, talk, are what we see in small island states and, and um, sea level rise. We can, we can look at the beginnings of projections forward. I mean, we, we talk about one, degree, uh, one meter, two meter, Sure, one meter, two meter. If we're being, if we're, living, um, you know, meters. If we see sort of rapid north ice, ice shelf collapse, um, and that happens pretty quickly. So that's, I think, that's one of the areas that we're particularly interested in because of the unique sort of work here. Um, uh, aquatic food security is the other area we don't do a particularly good job of capturing. We're we're quite clever. We're quite good. We think at looking at terrestrial food security. We do a really good job. We think of understanding both the emissions profiles of agriculture and land use change, as well as the sort of decline in global yield potential and what that translates through into childhood malnutrition. What we really don't do a good job of is understanding um, how that translates into the oceans. Part of the reason for that is because it's complex and because climate change is not the only factor there. And we are always trying to isolate, we focus on climate change. So we are always trying to isolate that climate signal. And that makes it difficult because for the most part, what we're facing is actually overfishing is actually just sort of poor, um, poor sort of human management. What is happening, I think, is that climate change in the background is undermining sort of some of the things there. I mean, if we don't, if we're not careful, we'll turn around in 20 years and, and be, and be caught out. Um, the only other thing, and I was talking about this uh, just before we started, quite a few of our models, quite a few of our atmospheric models, our, our um, air pollution models, our climate models, they break down at the, at the sort of spatial resolution of a small island state. And so we, I think, acknowledge that we do a good job of tracking large land masses and tracking those impacts there. Yeah. But we don't do a good job of doing this here. And so we're going to try to start to say, well, actually, we need two or three different methods. And we need a special method just for small island states and just completely separate those two things out and acknowledge that they are two completely different methodological questions. And we don't have the expertise to do that. But 
The thing is, the CMIH has the data, very granular, very small, from different points in small islands. But the problem is, have the health data to be yeah. superimposed, because you might have national, monthly or yearly data, but they're useless if you yeah. want to see the impact on, on, on very small scale. Yeah. But that's an issue we have to work on in the Caribbean. Yeah. Good. Right, thank Any you. Other yes, yeah. go ahead, Elisa. Hi, Elisa Prieto, City Advisor uh, with PAHO. I just didn't want to let this opportunity to go to emphasize mental health. And the first presenter made this point. I think it's something very unique to the Caribbean where we have the potential of a hurricane wiping out um, an entire country. And the implications of that are huge, right? We, we saw it with Dominica, Antigua, and Barbuda, and Barbuda having to be evacuated. One hurricane can impact more than one country. So. Um, I think mental health is something we need to put in the radar. Um, there's a lot of stigma in the Caribbean, a lot of stigma in small communities. So this is a great entry point, I think, to bring this issue and, and you know, try and, and um, tackle some of the barriers and strengthen mental health services. So I didn't want to let the opportunity to make that point. Excellent. Nick, you want to say something? I hope you don't mind my commenting specifically. I, Go ahead. The mental health impacts of climate change are something that I am most profoundly concerned about. The, the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder of schizophrenia three months after some of these, some of these events um, are profound. We struggle, we really struggle to track mental health and climate change for two reasons. One, because the world just does a terrible job of tracking mental health anyway, right? We just don't know, you know, take the most extreme expression of mental health of mental ill health suicide we just don't even really know how many people sort of commit suicide on a day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year basis around the world let alone the full spectrum of mental ill health as it sort of as it spreads across and then on the other side the climate attribution gets tough as well what i'd love to see us start to do and i'd love to see sort of the health and climate change community start to do is not just focus on the negatives i'd love to see us start to focus on the mental health benefits of a robust response what ecosystem-based adaptation does to improving improving mental health, what, um, what sort of strengthening some of those mental health services and community resilience services um, do to improve mental health, green space, blue space, that sort of, that sort of work. Um, I think we should be turning this into a positive opportunity to sort of strengthen mental health in the community rather than just a negative. Any other? Yes. Hi, Maddie Murphy with the George Lane Chronic Disease Research Center, part of um, UWI. So I had a question because I know a lot of what you all are doing is tracking and it's a lot of quantitative research that's being put into this. And I'm wondering what is the role of a, a qualitative researcher? And we're doing quite a lot in the Caribbean, especially with communities um, in, in, in a number of islands. Uh, a lot of it is community based. A lot of it is qualitative based. And I was wondering how useful that is, you know, for what you all are looking for as well. Um, it's essential, isn't it? Uh, I you know, think so. Uh, for, for me, it definitely is. A, a, number, a number is just a number. It doesn't mean anything unless it's accompanied by a story and unless we understand the human life behind that number. Um, we try to pair the two. Okay. We try really, really hard to make sure that we capture um, not just the number of health systems that are responding, but the ways in which they're responding, the qualitative aspect of their plans, how well they think they are doing, how well the rest of the world thinks someone is doing. Um, we try to capture, to the extent that we do look at sea level rise and migration, we do that quantitatively, but we are also particularly interested in identifying sort of some of the qualitative research around the push-pull factors there. Um, I think the caveat for us is that we want to make sure we do both. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that we are tracking indicators, we're doing it on an annual basis, we're coming back every year, we want a number, but then we want to know what that number means. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay, I think uh, that brings us to... Uh, Oh, sorry, go ahead. In the back, last, last, last contribution, last intervention. Yes, hi, good day. Thank you for an excellent lecture. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Dr. Brathwaite, Diane Brathwaite. I'm from the Barbados Diabetes Foundation. Um, thank you for bringing up the point about mental health, but I, I, I think that um, if we can frame it from the concept of mental wellness, given that it's something that I deal with all the time, it's a difficult topic, and something that, for example, like as Caribbean people, we don't like to think about mental health because of the stigmas attached. And my question really is, how do we tie mental wellness 
um, to that concept of psychological aid that was mentioned. And say we had like a massive, um, you know, catastrophe in Barbados, how do we set up our system as small islands where they were actually able to deliver? What's the construct for delivering this psychological aid? Who do we train? We don't have enough health professionals to deliver these types of aids that have been mentioned. That's my first comment. My second comment was, I think that there may be a need to have blueprints for construction for environmentally friendly buildings. Um, so maybe somebody can just comment um, on that specifically as well. So who wishes to pick up those two very important issues? Elisa. I can maybe comment on the first question and I totally agree that there's a need to build that community resilience and psychological first aid is precisely a tool designed for anyone to provide that, you know, uh, care through the look, listen and link those other principles. And um, PAHO has been working in collaboration with the Caribbean Development Bank on adapting the guidance that is available so that it's a tool that can be used by the community. And we have been using illustrations to do that. So I can share, yeah, the, the thing is, how do we take that out there? How do we train the community leaders? How do we do a better job? And, and there's a funding gap, and that's why I keep bringing the issue of mental health, mental wellness. You know, that I agree that we need to think how we frame it so that we, um, you know, tackle those barriers and that stigma. But I feel that climate change is a very good narrative to try to, you know, get that across. So um, maybe we can chat afterwards and I can share the materials. I try to answer uh, comment on the mental of the environmental friendly buildings, which I think it is such an obvious issue to be to be looking at. The concept being applied now for building buildings and offices in the Caribbean is actually atrocious, and the sick building syndrome is is popping up for for decades now. I've go into buildings that you actually hit a. Uh, wall walking in you can smell it you can feel it and then people ask what to do i said well open the window oh we can't that throw a brick through them that window and that window you used to get some breeze it is atrocious and it is not rocket science the old days i happen to live in an old house in in barbados and it is i'm cold at night now and no and no ac just the breeze and actually the, the whole concept has to change and we build nonsense that require AC and we get molds and it is really not really difficult. But we have to apply the basic concepts of uh, physics, building physics, ventilation, temperature control, humidity control. It's not rocket science, really. And it has to start, of course, with the architects that go to the Europe or whatever and build temperate climate or snow country buildings in, in the Caribbean. Oh, come on. Comes back to our <laughs> comes back to our concept of what constitutes development. Exactly. And who has imposed that concept of of what constitutes development on us in these uh, right. lower income and middle income countries. And that's being done both in terms of climate change, in terms of what we eat and what we, Oh, my, well, you've opened a can of worms. Yeah, but just, just, uh, without, just food for thought. Whole, uh, Sorry to interrupt. Contribution you. there. Yeah, just um, a quick I'm point. I'm beginning to look at no, the time, although I, no, no, I'm not, no, no, it's I'm okay. not stopping you. I just want to be sure I'm capturing uh, the sense of what is taking place. So, yeah. as long as there's enthusiasm and interest in discussing these issues, I'm quite prepared to continue. Yeah, all I want to suggest, or what I wanted to suggest or open by my question is, maybe there needs to be a code for the Caribbean, maybe there need to be incentives for businesses that are willing to follow the code, etc. We have fallen into a situation where we're caught up in development and it's almost like anything that is done westernly, that's what I want to do. I want a building, I go and I look on the computer for something that's been done somewhere else. So I'm just suggesting that that um, the department needs to look at how they encourage it because it's actually something that's very important thank Good. you last two comments or observations everyone's had a chance to yes okay yes go ahead hi my name is jonathan uh drury i'm with the pan american health organization really the point was just being new to the caribbean i had a conversation a few weeks ago with a group that does a lot of 
involvement with civil society and environmental management and ecology. And my, my question to them was, as we work with health systems and with health uh, services and in the public health systems, uh, how do we really engage them and mobilize them and move this uh, forward with climate change and health through civil society? and through community-based organizations. And they responded that we're really in the Caribbean, there are not a lot of, of groups. And then I asked about environmental health and the same response. Now, whether that's accurate, I don't know, but I think my, my comment or question is, what are we gonna do at the community level and in building up this capacity uh, within civil society to then help us along the way with the engagement and with moving along health systems? I suppose I should try to answer that <laughs> and say that it's for that very reason why the Healthy Caribbean Coalition was formed some, whatever, 11 years ago, because we recognize that uh, the civil society voice was not at the table where it mattered. And so that is a, that, that's, as I said, the origins of the, of the HCC. Thus far, we have been concentrating and focusing on chronic diseases. But our lead in this initiative today, in fact, reflects a decision taken by the directors of the Healthy Caribbean Coalition that we needed to go, if you will, beyond or have an even wider uh, net. And uh, in that regard, uh, we have identified climate change as a major area of focus for us uh, going forward. But you've really posed uh, an even more fundamental question, which is the, uh, the, the role and function of civil society civil society organizations with, with, within countries. And really, if you think about it, it really, is, it, it, it really speaks to the, the growth and development of the democratic process within societies. And I, I submit that within the Caribbean, uh, we are continuing to strengthen and evolve the democratic process and in so doing, uh, uh, this is leading to and contributing to a strengthen of civil society. I don't want to get into this in too much detail, but even, uh, and particularly here in Barbados, there's been over the last year change of government, and it's particularly noticeable that the prime minister uh, has been addressing this issue and the, the need to engage and involve uh, uh, civil society. But there are some other issues taking place which I think will add to, to the civil society growth and development. And strange, strangely enough, it comes from, from a completely different, I think, uh, reason. And that is uh, the need to address issues of, of money laundering through um, charities and not-for-profit organizations, which are civil society organizations, because it's been recognized that there needs to be greater scrutiny, greater accountability of these organizations throughout the world and throughout the Caribbean. And all of the Caribbean countries are taking action in this regard. I think, therefore, that's going to lead to uh, greater governance, greater accountability, greater management, and hopefully, and these organizations will become increasingly fit for purpose. It's a very, very important issue I think you've, you've, you've raised there. I think on that note, I, I want to now bring the, uh, this um, event, launch event, to a close. Uh, I can't do so, of course, without thanking the Lancet Countdown for inviting the HCC to take the lead uh, in the launch regionally. I particularly wish to express thanks to Nick, uh, who, as I said, is the lead author of the report, for visiting with us and sharing the report. I also wish to express a special thanks to all the speakers from the region. Um, 
I think your presence here a, f a few days before Christmas uh, is a clear indication of your concerns about, about climate change. I, of course, also wish to express special thanks to Ministers Bostick and, and Prescott, and really to, to, to let them know in their absence, although they are both aware directly from me, that the Healthy Caribbean Coalition stands ready to support them fully as it does stand ready to support policymakers throughout the, throughout the region. A special uh, thanks also to the uh, partnering organizations, you, you've been made aware of them. And I also wanted to uh, uh, shout out in particular, Maisha Hutton, who is the executive director of the HCC, and Jessica Beagley, who is the manager, policy manager at Lancet Countdown. They are the ones who really did all of the work. And any success that uh, you've seen here today, uh, one can attribute to them. And I'd like you all to give them a big round of applause. <laughs> and of course, I wish to thank all of you for attending and actively participating. So going forward, building on our activities and, and initiatives and today's launch, the HCC plans acting as a convener, an advocate and a champion to contribute to further action on climate change throughout the region as it relates in particular to the health and the NCD dimension. All of us now need then, given what we have heard, uh, to go forward taking meaningful action aimed at addressing climate change and health. For as, and she's been quoted many times and, uh, and appropriately so, for as the Honorable Mia Moore Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, said at the Global Climate Action Summit last year, she said, I look to everyone in this room to act, but I look to everyone who hears my voice to act for my country, for our region, for our island nations in the Caribbean and the Pacific, for vulnerable communities everywhere. Our future and the future of generations yet to come is at stake. And if we wait any longer, it will be far too late to save it." End quote. All I can say, having said that, is let us therefore now go forward, forearmed, forewarned, and be guided accordingly. At this point, it is my pleasure to invite you to refreshments, which are available. And I'm hoping very much that these very, very uh, interesting discussions will continue. I am hoping that one of the specific outcomes will be that um, some of the major organizations and entities in the Caribbean that are represented here, that their logos will feature uh, on that slide, the Lancet Countdown slide, that feature prominently, I might add, um, uh, that that was displayed. And certainly, I, I, I look forward to some very exciting times in this area. Thanks very much.